Today, I'm going to talk to you about optimizing funnels and tunnels so you can convert content into contacts into cash. Search engine optimization, social media, and content marketing are all just pieces of a much larger puzzle. Today, I'm going to talk about how they fit together. It is great to be here with you today to talk about optimizing funnels and tunnels uh, to turn content into contacts into cash. Uh, it is uh, exciting to be here at the Content Strategy Collective Live uh, conference and to do this presentation uh, for you. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to tell you how to uh, get a free copy of my latest book, The Digital Pivot, Secrets of Online Marketing, with a foreword by David Pogue. So be sure to stick around to the end so you can figure out how to get a free copy of my bestseller, The Digital Pivot, Secrets of Online Marketing. So if your content conversion strategy is working already, uh, you don't need to hear what I'm going to tell you today. So you're dismissed. Have a great day. Uh, but if you're looking for a way to grow a digital business uh, or increase your conversion rates, uh, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you about tunnels and funnels. Um, I'm going to talk to you about converting content into contacts into cash. Now, you don't have to be a screenwriter to produce a movie. Uh, you don't have to be an architect to build a house, and you don't have to be a software engineer to oversee and manage a digital pivot. But you do need to understand the sequence of events and the specialties involved, because like producing a movie or building a building, there's a logical order to getting it done. Um, you know, motion picture starts with a script. Constructing a house starts with a set of architectural plans, and a digital pivot starts with a website because content marketing is really a waste of time if you don't have a way to convert traffic uh, from organic search into revenue. And there's no buy button or search engine results. And there's no buy button on a search engine results page. And if someday there is, expect to pay a hefty commission on that sale, just like Amazon Marketplace uh, or a restaurant that sells on Grubhub. Um, anytime you're selling to someone else's audience, expect uh, that marketplace or reseller to take a huge bite out of your profit margin. Um, you know, it's one thing to pay 30% to acquire a customer, but paying a 30% commission to retain a customer is unsustainable. So getting your funnel right really is your first priority because there's no sense in building tunnels to funnels if you don't have some certainty over what percentage will convert. The logical order for leading a digital pivot starts with own media before social media, social media before earned media, and earned media before paid media. Uh, but what exactly is earned, shared, owned, and paid media anyways, and why are these distinctions useful? Well, before I answer that question, let's talk about where we are today with digital marketing. Digital marketing is kind of like the gold rush of the modern ages. Of the 100,000 prospectors who came out to California to stake their claim, very few found gold. But a guy named Sam Brennan made the equivalent of $4 million a month selling picks and shovels. Today, there are more digital gurus out there selling picks and shovels then there are organizations using digital media to communicate with stakeholders effectively, to convert awareness 
in transactions. But there are some who have found a way to outperform in the age of Instagram. This talk is about how to become one of them. As I said, your website, social media, and search engine optimization are all just pieces of a much larger puzzle. Today, I'm gonna to show you how these channels fit together. Without a framework for organizing a digital pivot, we're all just panning for gold downstream instead of mining at the source. Meanwhile, our competitors are getting better every day. When I think about digital marketing, I'm reminded of a ballerina pivoting on toe point. No one would take a ballet master seriously who told students that they'd be principal dancers with the New York City Ballet in a four hour work week because it's understood that mastery of this centuries old art form comes through well-defined stages of training, right? It takes years of practice to master. Digital marketing, on the other hand, is still, still in its infancy. So there's a ton of confusion about what it is and how to do it well. And the most frequent mistake I see made when I come in to consult with an organization is a misunderstanding of how to sequence the digital marketing channels successfully. The fact is you need to learn to walk before you can run. To reach your stakeholders online, you don't just need followers, you need to own those followers, right? You need a direct relationship with them. So you're not reliant on a third party like the alleged fake news or polarized social networks to land your message. Followers are like a pair of toe shoes. You still need the choreography to execute a pivot turn. Like a young dancer who rushes out eager to spin in her first pair of toe shoes only to come tumbling down, organizations tend to pull back the curtain on their digital marketing initiatives before they're ready. There is a sequence to executing a pivot turn and there's a sequence to executing a digital pivot. But what exactly is that sequence? Digital marketing is as much an art as it is a science, right? There's almost always more than one right answer to every problem. And if there's more than one right answer, then ideas are really a dime a dozen What's important is execution. Think of digital marketing like grassroots communications. You're talking directly to customers with different motivations, levels of education, and partisan allegiances. Let's say you record a great podcast, but the audio levels are inconsistent, right? How, how does that characterize the competency of your organization or your brand in the mind of the stakeholder? How do you feel when you're watching a show on TV and you have to turn the volume up and down all the time because it's not a healthy enough level to hear people talk and then it's too loud when there's the car chase? So the takeaway is if you're distributing a podcast, your digital communications competency extends beyond the message to production quality as well, right? If you put out a joint press release that says the U.S. presidential election was secure, but you bury the lead in the second paragraph in the document, and it reads like an AP test question because it's so obtuse, it can't even be found through Google search, you're rushing on stage before you're ready. Digital marketing is not just for e-commerce. It's not just for B2B, it's for government too. It's for policymakers, it's for nonprofits, it's for charities, it's for everyone. So really what I'm talking about today applies not just to B2Bs or, or e-commerce or small business. This applies to anyone who's trying to communicate, win audience, sell policy, sign people up for programs and events, 
uh, online. Digital communications impacts organizational reputation, which means we're no longer just marketers. We need the skills to quarterback digital media production, website content management, and search engine optimization, because without these capabilities, we're relegated to social media, where engagement-based amplification algorithms lift the most sensational, outrageous stories to the top of the newsfeed, where we are reliant on a third party to reach our audience and where we can be deplatformed at a moment's notice without warning. In grassroots communications, consistently performing at an elite level requires resources most organizations and even some vendors don't have. Right up to now, we're not media outlets, we're just media contacts. But if we're, going to con if we're going to connect with constituents, customers, and leads online, we need to be able to do it as well as news media outlets. We're essentially competing against them, which means the same message has to land with the news media and the public alike. So we have to be at least as good, if not better, than they are in the packaging and delivery of timely, compelling news. It takes a high level of literacy, persistence, effort, and imagination to consistently create and deliver compelling digital content on tight deadlines. Right? It's no coincidence, politics aside, that President Trump hired over a dozen former Fox executives to serve in his administration. Because for communicators today, right, your ability to win hearts and minds online outweighs your public policy and government administration knowledge and skill. For two decades, I traveled around the globe helping teams pivot to digital. Unfortunately, the war against digital illiteracy will not be won through keynote speeches like this one. What's required is hands-on training. You can learn strategy and big ideas at conferences, but actual training in a wired classroom with broadband access, step-by-step -step tutorials, and instruction is what's required to develop applied digital marketing skills. Even if you're not the one doing it day by day, if you don't have some idea of how the sausage is made, it's pretty tough to manage the butcher shop. You can hear people talk about the benefits of social media all day long, but until someone actually teaches you how to embed an Instagram post in a podcast or build a conversion funnel, and you have that experience yourself, you lack the necessary applied skills, right? We don't have secretaries to operate typewriters anymore on our behalf, and you shouldn't have to rely on technicians to communicate on your behalf online. Every marketing person, every communicator, every PR person should have basic web content management skills. I've led sessions like these for thousands of marketers and communicators all over the world. And every December, I would always try to schedule a session in New York. That way, I could combine my New York training with a family trip just before the holidays. My wife loves ballet, and when my son was a toddler, she'd dress him up real cute in a little suit with a bow tie, and we'd take him to see the Nutcracker at Lincoln Center. He was like four or five, and we'd give him a lollipop and prop him up in the seat. And one year, she managed to get us front row center seats, like the very first row right in the middle. I'll never forget it because you could actually lean forward and look down in the orchestra pit. It was amazing. And when the ballerinas came on stage and the principals performed the solos and they spun around effortlessly on the tip of their toe, like a music box fairy, without moving a single muscle, 
it's an incredible display of artistry and athleticism. And my jaw dropped, right? Because I'm right there and I can really see it well. And I thought, wow, that's fantastic. Because it looks so easy. But in reality, a pivot turn, as ballet masters call them, is anything but effortless. The Disney Channel had this series on called On Point about kids who try to get an apprenticeship with the New York City Ballet. It's really competitive. They only accept a handful of applicants, right? These are the kids on trains for two hours after school to get the Lincoln Center just to practice, right? They do their homework on the ride home. They basically sacrifice their entire childhood in hopes of a big break. And you watch it and you realize, while it's beautiful to see the ballerina turn on point, it doesn't start there. Behind the scenes, there's a ton of preparation, training, and discipline that goes into it. And I think the big reason so many organizations fail when they pivot to digital is they rush out and spin before they're ready. Someone sees a social media profile of a competitor with a ton of engagement and they think, wow, that's terrific. I want to do that. But they may not have the skills. And so their message falls flat right? Or it gets taken out of context or it gets distorted or falsified by their opposition. So as it turns out, the sequence is the secret to a successful digital pivot, right? We start with own media before shared media or social media, right? Then we proceed to earn media. And finally, if it's warranted and there's budget, we might add paid media. Mass media is classified by format, right? You have print, electronic, cable, terrestrial TV, and radio. But that scheme is not really useful anymore because today newspapers have email newsletters and blogs. Print magazines have apps and audio podcasts and live streams. TV stations have websites and YouTube channels. So now we classify media by type. Now, here's a cheat sheet that explains each channel. Own media, well, that's your website or mobile app. That's the foundation. Next comes shared media, which is your social media footprint. After that is earned media, that's third. And that's third-party news media coverage. And paid media is fourth, which is online advertising. Just like the ballerina's pivot, a digital pivot is also a series of steps performed in a sequential order. And here you can see that logical order, right? The ballerina starts by getting her balance and stability. And a digital pivot starts by getting your website ready for customers, right? You wouldn't invite people over to your house without straightening up first. And you should invite people to your website until it's been cleaned up too. Step one is own media, and that's your website. And it's really the most important and underappreciated part of a digital pivot. In the second part of the pirouette, the ballerina pushes off to find her access. And the second thing a visitor to your website is gonna do is scroll down to the footer menu find the links to your social media profiles and check them out to see if you found your access, right? They want to know, are you connected with your community online? Are you legit, right? You don't need a gazillion followers, but if you've got 12 subscribers on your YouTube channel and you're linking to it in the footer, that's a signal that your website's either out of date, not interesting, or that your own media channel is essentially one way, right? It sends the message, that there's no way to engage with you via social media, because if there was, there'd be at least some evidence of that in your profiles. Lack of engagement is bad for media relations, right? Journalists are measured by page views. If no one's engaging with your social media, it makes it riskier for them to write about you. 
So step two is shared media or social media. And it's how you find your access and prove to your stakeholders that you're part of their, that you're part of their engaged community. Step three is earned media. And that's that beautiful arabesque position. That's what it's called. When the ballerina extends her arms and spins on point. And this is what we marvel at us on stage. This is when my jaw dropped and I thought, wow. And if you think about it, right, it's not unlike the admiration we have for others when they're celebrated in the news or they go viral online. But without taking the owned and shared media steps first, earned media coverage is impossible because people use your owned and shared media to qualify you. But before you pitch for earned media, right, you have to have your owned and shared media in order. That way you have the greatest potential to drive growth, right? Despite partisan allegiances, earned media is still considered unbiased and impartial. It's kind of like a testimonial, but it's more legit because it's on someone else's website. And we trust what other people say about us more than what we say about ourselves. And referral links from news sites have the greatest potential to drive growth, which is why you need to be ready to convert that traffic before you create it, or what's the point of going on point? This is the type of earned media placement that really drives conversions, right? This is the leverage point. You can't publish on Fast Company, or TechCrunch without editorial approval, right? You can't show up with a skyscraper post or a longer listicle or do a link swap. You have to write meaningful articles with new ideas and a fresh perspective. In any competitive environment, these are the earned media links that matter most, right? We have to lead with our thoughts, which is why they call it thought leadership marketing. If you just write a piece that rehashes what everyone knows already, you're not a thought leader, you're a thought repeater. And that won't get you published on Fast Company, which is a high conversion tunnel. Now, I get emails every day from people who want to write for my blog. Most pitches come from a Gmail address that looks like it was made up for the purpose of pitching guest posts. I can't verify the sender. And the posts they try and, and send me are so generic, empty, and meaningless, they'd actually hurt my reputation more than they'd help it. Now, I'd love free content for my blog if it was good, but if I published this crap, it would hurt my ability to get published at major sites. Right When I pitch to Fast Company, they check my blog, and if what they find is vapid, I don't get considered. Earn media is media coverage you earn on a credible third-party website. So in this example, you see a funnel, which is the website, right? That's the owned media. When people come to your website to check you out, your job is to convert them into leads or customers or stakeholders or supporters or, or advocates, right? Or, 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 or association members. Uh, your job is to get them to take some action, right? These are the stages they go through when they're deciding whether or not to take that action. Right? Awareness, consideration, evaluation. If it's not purchase, then it's some other sort of transaction. Um, often they're searching for answers to problems they have. They find your website. Hopefully you've calibrated your content to get found by people looking for answers to problems you solve at different stages of the customer journey. Um, and when someone who's problem aware, right, if they just have a problem, but they don't know how to solve it, that's top funnel. If they are solution aware, they have some idea of how to solve the problem, but they don't know what brand to buy it from, that's mid funnel. And then if they're brand aware, that's bottom of the funnel. Um, if you're selling an impulsive product like pizza or hoodies, there probably isn't much consideration or evaluation going on, right? These are impulse purchases. They see it, they buy it. But on the other case, if you're at B2B and there's an ongoing relationship, 
uh, that's going to be much more important. So it's all about calibrating your content for the top, the middle, and the bottom of the funnel. Um, at the bottom of the funnel, right, you either capture the lead or make the sale. That's own media. That's your funnel. And once it's been optimized, you're ready to start building tunnels through shared or paid. Because once it's been optimized, you know what percentage of traffic you're going to convert. And so you can actually do the math and see how much money you're going to make and know how much you can invest based on those conversion numbers. So let's talk for a minute about the tools you need to drive demand and automate lead generation. Let's talk about stacks, automation, and funnels. This is a movie studio backlot. And these are not real buildings. They have no interiors. The same is true of a website without a conversion funnel, right? It's not what I'm talking about when I say own media presence. I'm talking about a website that you can interact with. Now, just as buildings on the back lot of a movie studio are just facades, websites without a tech stack behind them are just digital facades. Right at the end of the day, in the world of digital marketing, what really separates the winners from the losers is interoperable backend technology. And to compete in this environment, you need a few basic tools and they need to talk to each other so you can streamline workflows and collect digital usage activity to inform your strategy moving forward. TikTok is addictive because they show you content based on your behavior, right? The app is just one piece of the equation. They're collecting information about you. Some even think through your camera and using predictive analytics to decide what to show you next. Your website is just the presentation layer of your tech stack. It's just the doorway through which you engage stakeholders. In order to allow people to sign up for emails or register for events, you need web forms to collect contact information. Good web form tools that don't pick up a ton of spam registrations and contaminate your email database are different from the content management system you use to publish content on your website. Now, after they sign up, you need a place to store that contact information. And that's where the customer relationship management or CRM comes into place. In the world of digital communications, the customer relationship management system or CRM for short is really the backstop of a tech stack. And these are the largest B2B software companies in the world right now, like Salesforce, Oracle, and Microsoft. But there are simpler options that are much less expensive and easier to set up and manage as well. Um, to have an interoperable stack, you want your contact registrations to flow directly into your CRM. And in order to communicate directly with these contacts, you need an email marketing platform that's integrated with your CRM. This is a very basic tech stack. These tools are all interoperable. Together, they give you the ability to leverage your own media presence to build an email contact list that you can push content directly to. Tie in web analytics, and you can capture anonymously activity about the users on your website. And the activity to your registered contacts is not anonymous because they're registered in your CRM. And if you send them an email and they click, you'll be able to monitor that activity and keep a copy of it on the CRM uh, record for that customer or lead. Right, this is a basic tech stack for converting content into contacts, into connections, or into cash. This is covered more in chapter three of my book, Stacks, Automation, and Funnels. So stick around to the end. I'm going to tell you how to get a free copy of the book. Here's a simple three-page conversion funnel for a gated content offering, like a white paper, right? In order to do this, I need the tech stack like the one I just showed you, 
right? This is my funnel for my essential digital marketing skills report, which lists the most in-demand digital marketing skills organizations want from employees right now. The first page of this funnel has promo art that advertises the report. You can see it's, it's outlined here, right? Uh, in the red dotted line. So the only, uh, right, if you click on this, it loads a landing page. And you can see there's no header or footer on the landing page. The only action you can take is filling out the form. Also, the graphics and colors in the promo art match the graphics and colors of the landing page, which is really important because people move quickly and they want to know that what they clicked on is what they're getting. Um, the next page you go to from here, if you fill it out, right, is you get this confirmation page that says, yep, we got your message. It's on its way. Um, after that, you get a customized email, which has a link to the white paper. Uh, now, one thing to keep in mind, um, if you do a link to a white paper, people can just share the link. Uh, in this case, I'm actually linking uh, to a file um, that's attached to the email. So just a pro tip, uh, if you're shopping for an email marketing platform, go with something that can do autoresponders with attachments of at least five megs. Um, my email autoresponder messages are always just plain text. I don't use images because I don't want them to look like, you know, blasts. I want them to look more like personal one-on-one -on -one emails. Uh, and the message is sent from, an e from my email address, not some generic email address. So if someone responds, I get it. And, um, and I let people know that in the text. In order to do this, your web forms have to be integrated with your CRM and your CRM has to be integrated with your email marketing platform. If you don't have those three pieces, you can't do this in a way that is competitive um, because you don't are unable to collect the data and home run it to a CRM and collect that data uh, with your contacts in your CRM. Because ultimately what you wanna be able to do is sort the records in your database by who opened the emails, who opened your emails most, who spent the most time on your different pages, um, uh, who clicked your emails the most. Um, you can also look at what pages they visited when they got to your site. So all that data can be used to then sort and qualify and separate automatically the warm from the cold leads. In this case, when you sign up <clears throat> for uh, something on my site, I can give you a, um, a cadence of emails uh, using uh, my email marketing platform. I can do you know eight drip messages over a period of time, over an eight course of eight weeks. Of course, you can unsubscribe at any time, but rather than give you a brain dump on that first email, you know, the likelihood that you're going to read it all is very low. Whereas if I give you short messages over a period of eight weeks, the likelihood that you'll read one or two of them is much higher. So that you can see three different messages in the program. So to recap, in a digital pivot, own media is the first step. Shared or social is the second step. Earn media is the third step. And once those channels are optimized, you can use paid media to increase transactions more predictably. But regardless of the taxes, of the tactics you execute and the resources you marshal, right, to get the job done, this is the choreography for executing a digital pivot. Owned, shared, earned, and paid. The secret is the sequence. I, I've read a ton of books on digital marketing. It is a very diverse topic with lots of specialties. I saw a lot of, I've, I've read a lot of great books about specialties, but I saw very few useful overview books, right? I saw books that covered analytics, SEO, content, automation funnels, but not one book that covered it all for the general business reader that explained from a big picture standpoint, what you need to know to quarterback a sustainable digital pivot. Um, that's what this book is. It really is a digital marketing MBA in a single title. And it's currently, be, currently being used 
in the master's programs at NYU, University of Toronto, and Crichton University. Now you can go much deeper into SEO or social media or content marketing and other books, but this is a high level jargon free book with interesting stories and a few jokes about how owned, shared, earned, and paid fit together. And I hope you learned some of that from this talk today. Now, if you want a free copy of my book, here's how to do it. Just go to my Twitter account right now, which is at Eric Schwartzman, my name, and look at the tweet I've got pinned on my profile and like it. Just like that tweet and then follow me and I'll DM you a link to a digital copy of my book. So again, go to at ericschwartzman.com, like the pinned post on my profile page and follow me and I'll DM you a link to the book. It's been my honor to be here with you this morning to share my experience, strength and hope for a brighter digital marketing tomorrow. Thank you.